Thank you. Oh, so thank you. That was beautifully spoken. Thank you. Yep. I think there's many different scenarios for many different people in relations to that. Um, we, every, uh, everyone um, in the room has probably, in, in relation to Aboriginal people, whether it's their country or not, have experienced, you know, being on, on a community. And I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure, when the question came through, we were somewhat taken back as to how to respond to this. We could probably put out a number of different scenarios. Um, I think we're... You know, my, but um, Thomas hit it on the head re really, really well. Um, there, and, and not unlike urban, um, Kerry, as Kerry um, very clearly put it, the, the further isolation and the lack of services make that more complex sometimes. Um, but community or Aboriginal people, our, our families are critical to us. And so we have responsibilities like everybody else um, to meet those obligations on a daily basis. We get up like everybody else. It's about, you know, a feed. It's about family. It's about caring, nurturing our responsibilities. And they're the basic core things that happen whether you're living in the suburbs or whether you're living out in the bush, you know, um, on community. We, we it, They're fundamentally the same. Um, it's just that the ambience and appearance is different. And I think, too, what I always say is that we all go to Coles and do our shopping. Yeah. <laughs> Coles everywhere. <laughs> yeah, not much um, dissimilar to what has been said here. And, and like I said, Thomas hit it on the head. It's about where you are and where you feel comfortable. I've been lucky enough to actually um, leave Western Australia as a 15, 16-year-old, live in the Northern Territory, live in South Australia for 25, 28 years, and then come home in the last four years. I went away and I, went, I did my journey, but my journey was trying to find something that I was looking for and I didn't find it till I came home four years ago. And I came back home and I found out where I belong and who I belong with. And it's great. And I'm, I'm, I'm a Wadjuk person from here in Perth, yet I've lived out on the West Australian Northern Territory border. I've lived in Aboriginal communities through the Northern Territory, through the Central Northern Territory, and also worked and communicated from Kiripiti, Udindatta, all the Flinders Ranges all around there, the West Coast of Sejuna, all the way around South Australia over the last 25 years or so. And to come home now and to find solace, space, place, belonging, I love it. I've spent half my life looking for something I already had at home all the time. But I think I had to go and find that somewhere else to come back to get it here. And that's what people need to do. And I think when our mob live in their community, because I've seen people in community, like, like, like Tom says, and they are content. They are doing what they want to do with what they want to do it with and who what they want to do, you know, just enjoying it. The only time that we need external assistance is when we get sick, unfortunately, or any other things. Um, the space in the community at home, where you come from, is what non-Aboriginal feel is when they go home from work in the afternoon and they kick their shoes off and they walk in their house and they feel comfortable in the yard and they mow their lawns, they wash their dishes or throw them in the dishwasher and do whatever and they feel comfortable. You know, I walk, and since I walk into my house at home here in Perth now, I take my shoes off and that's, that's how I know I'm home, I do that. And I don't put them on until I leave that house again. So that's what, you know, if we can relate that to how we feel with our family and stuff coming to our residential homes, no matter where you are in Australia, owning that place, belonging in that place, is what we feel when we go to a community. But the community connects us to who we are. What connects me to who I am now is I go to the river. Every weekend I'm down the river. If I'm not fishing, I'm walking or swimming in the river. That's my home. It's a kilometre from where I was born. It's five kilometres where my mother's buried and my brothers are buried and my aunties are buried my grandparents are buried. All that. So that's what we feel in relation to culture, in relation to where we are in the community. So, yes, it is good to have an understanding of what community feels like for Aboriginal people in various places, remote places, but we've got to also remember that there are people here in Perth or other places who actually feel the same way as what people feel in Jigalong or Nangarawili or other places like that, Waluna. We need to make sure that we cover that as well because we all have our own place and our own space and that community is is um, is not fixtures it's actually place and space we've just got a question out here oh good yeah 
Yeah, thank you. So I'm Sasha Andrew. I'm Acting Aboriginal Health um, Liaison Coordinator here at Royal Perth. And um, so my family connection is Yaru Mob from Broome. I've grown up here, Noongar country. Um, I think I agree with what Ian's saying and everyone that the feeling and the connection and, and making sure that we understand that we all have things in common is really important. But also not assuming that because we've been to a community or because we know someone that we know what that person's experience is like. It's really important for clinicians to approach everyone as an individual and, and engage with that person, you know, ask them what their day's like back home. Talk to, say, their family or next of kin if they're not, not comfortable and actually see what, what their life is like because you might have one person from Waluna who, you know, goes about their day in a very similar way to the way I would go about my day here. But you might also have a man who's an elder who, it says no fixed address on his sticker, but he is a transient man who hunts in the bush and he has responsibilities. So he might say, no, I don't have a job, but his job is to pass on his knowledge to his community. And his job is, he's, he's got those connections. He has lots of people he's responsible for. It might be law time back home. so. Engaging with an Aboriginal liaison officer or even just showing that if you have that time, you sit with the person and you actually ask them what their priorities are and what their life is like, what they want to go home to, you show them that you care about them and that the, the reason that you're doing the things you're doing, the procedures, the assessments and all of those things are linked back to getting them back to their life, whatever that looks like. Thank you. Very nicely said. Um, we also have another uh, question. Oh, sorry. Beth? No, go, please, Beth. Just a funny story related to that. Beware. X-ray meeting. Ten doctors in the room and Beth. The young doctor at the front desk who's less than 20 years of age, I reckon, probably still in primary school, says, this elderly lady, and she's five years younger than me. <laughs> the next patient, he says, this unemployed female. Not on a tick. Is she married? Oh, yeah, yeah, she's home with five kids. Darling pet, she is not an unemployed female. She is a mum with huge responsibility. And that's where we as health professionals need to get it right, yes? yes. You've got to yes. Laugh. Thank you. I think, yeah. I think what Beth raised is really, really important. And I really want people to, um, if, if they want to ask us questions, ask us questions. Because I think that there's, you know, we, there's a worldview that people have and there's a worldview that we have. But how do we actually um, come to a space that's actually appropriate? And, and Beth raised that. And we know that happens, for us as Aboriginal people, it happens to us on a daily basis pretty much. It's whether you're in the doctor's surgery or whether you get pulled over by the police officer or whether or not you're in coals and, you know, you're with your children and I've got a number of them and we move frequently in packs, to getting security to follow us because they're concerned that we're going to steal. So there's many different things that um, people need to probably... If you've, if you've got something in, you know, in that you're really burning to ask us, ask us because we will respond to it because what we want to do is move forward. We want you to have the opportunity to be able to enable um, you with the skills to engage Aboriginal people more effectively. Just recently, somebody asked my partner the other day, you know, oh, well, I, you know, you don't, do you really not need to pay for your house and your cars because you're Aboriginal because you just get loans um, given to you for nothing? You know, like, like, these are the types of things that are still happening for us as Aboriginal people today. So I really want you to um, ask us questions around anything. Um, there's, even within the cultural context, there um, is this belief that there's still things that happen in that Aboriginal space for us because of what's happened in the past. That actually is not true. Yeah. Um, within uh, um, another question, sorry. I just Thank wanted you. to make a couple of comments. Um, Denise from yes. East Metro Aboriginal Health. Um, we've just formed four community advisory groups and they are grandmothers, mothers, um, aunties, 
grandfathers. So I think that in terms of um, a day in their life, yes. what we actually see is um, they come to our meeting and they come to our meetings with, with all their responsibilities. And so, but I think that the, I think that key thing for them is part of their everyday life is advocating and trying to make a difference where they can. So they actually give of their time to come and sit down, talk to us, and we've got a long way to go in terms of making the changes we want as East Metro. Um, but that's a really important part for them. And so, you know, not just their family or their home obligation, they're actually strong advocates in the community to make a big difference in, in, in all of the mainstream hospitals and services. Yeah. And I think Denise touched on, so those people would have come from the stolen generation. And that's another question that was raised was, how do I, as a Wajala white person, understand the psychological impact that that has had on Aboriginal people? Because the Aboriginal people within this room are the sons and daughters of the stolen generation. They've experienced that trauma. And how do we um, learn enough compassion to, as we meet each Aboriginal person in healthcare, how do we ensure that we are, we've got that in our mind? You've been through great trauma and now I'm going to engage with you. How do we do that as white people? Um, I guess just in the, in the broader context, using our experiences with patients on our mental health ward, um, it's, it's trying to shift the clinician's um, mindset from the clinical thinking and sort of considering all of those unresolved grief and trauma that a lot of our families go through. So it goes, you know, it goes back to that intergenerational trauma stuff. So because these, sorts, these old um, events or these events that happened back those many years ago um, and we can still sort of resonate a little bit with some of our young mums that have babies today that can sort of relate the same feeling when they have social workers attached to them when they have babies in hospital. So automatically they, they know that DCP will be involved. So that's um, in today's space how a lot of our mums um, relate that sort of same impact. But I think just um, again it's about you know, understanding those cultural, the cultural history, the cultural impact that um, back many years ago and how I believe that that was never addressed and we never had the right or the correct resources or support in place to be able to provide those appropriate um, that support to us. So it is that ongoing unresolved grief. Um, and again, how do we do that? Um, do we do that collaboratively? How do we come together and, and, and resolve that? I look at um, one of the key things that a lot of people um, who I meet nowadays, because I've been away for so long, I'm still catching up with a lot of old people and people who from my family and people who I know my family and things like that. And I keep asking, I ask them the question, oh, did you know such and such and such and such from over here and over there? They go, oh, no, um, I was in a mission then or I was here then or I was here then. Now, some of these, some of these um, ladies and gentlemen are, you know, um, probably... Um, 20 years older than me, um, some even less. And one of the things that I find a lot of them struggling with is, is, is the trust issues with, with infrastructure and services. So one thing we need to understand as, as a collective is, is there is, it's still there, it, it's, it's still in our community. And the stories that they tell other people and they tell the family and it's passed down. Because one thing we need to understand is, is Aboriginal people, no matter where you come from across the country, are our oral communicators. We pass our history down through oral and pictorial processes. It's not written. And our mob sit down and tell yarns and yarn and yarn about things. And one of the things that a lot of families talk, some of them talk about, is the trauma they've had through being removed. And some have 
fine stories. They, in, they actually went to a nice place and they looked after really, really well. And a lot of them don't. And those stories come out and they actually talk about those to their kids. And then their kids feel that. We, they, they pass on that, that, that feeling and it, and it multiplies. And then they feel um, that they need to strike out or, or get um, radical. It happens. What, we, what would be good to have is, is a process where we can all deal with that. Yep, okay, Rudd said sorry. Okay, but what happens on the ground in relation to helping people do that? You know, there are lots of services out there, but the information is now down to young adults and to the middle structure of the families, my age, and then people who are younger than that. And they're, and they're saying, well, you know, you've always treated my grandparents really badly, so I'm going to act badly. And, okay, that's not the answer. So what we need to look at is within the health system is how can we work with someone who doesn't have the trust of the services? So we need to build that trust. And how do we build that trust? Is through acknowledging and working through that system and knowing what happened, when it happened, and the relevance of that. Um, before my mum passed away, she used to tell me the yarn that, her, that my grandmother used to hide them underneath her dress when she saw the man coming on the white horse. And they, and they lived out in the bush out the other side of Mora because they had to go and visit her sisters who were in actually the, the, um, in the Mugumba Mission, the side of the rabbit free fence. They were actually in there and they lived next door. And, you know, thinking now about the life that my mum had to experience just to visit and play with her sisters was playing through a fence. Not able to go and play with them in the yard, but playing through a fence. Your own sister and your own brother's. That's crazy. So it's a level of trust. And my mum, even when she died, she passed away. Even when she passed away, she didn't have. She did not have that level of trust. And that's happening, and that's passing down for people. It takes a lot of um, support and encouragement to our younger generation, people like myself. I call myself young, um, and compared to those other people, um, to how we can actually manage that trauma in our lives, in understanding that it happened to our people. You know, I see the stories. I see people saying, "Oh, we already said sorry already." It takes me a, it takes me a lot to get upset, but not seeing that sort of stuff happen is really, really not conducive to the, um, to a safe country that we live in. So, just to expand on that, some of the things I think is really important for. I'm not too sure how many people have done Aboriginal studies, and I know a lot of people do it as part of their course as clinicians. I think just to um, remind you of some of the past policies in relation to um, where we are today. In my time, I'm not that old, probably older than some of you, but um, Aboriginal um, people were not serviced in the hospital. That's not that long ago. That's right, this hospital. Aboriginal women were not allowed to birth in the hospital. They, if they had complications, they had to birth on the, on the verandas. So there's many things that even still currently are unremembered. And when you take into consideration where um, a, a group of people who um, storytelling is how, we, how we've come about to where we are today. It's only been in the last 100 years that we've started to write and record and things like that, one, 200 years that we started to write and record. So when you think about that, as there's quite a disparity in, in you know, what we do to record and what is written by white people in relation to Aboriginal people, again, it's not necessarily always the truth of the matter when we talk about um, the uh, historical factors for Aboriginal people. And then some of those um, policies are still actually in place today that impact on our presentations. I mean, you would be aware that, um, you know, after three missed appointments, you get knocked off the list and, you know, there are just so many different things within the health setting that impact on a minority, just not Aboriginal people, but a minority group of people that still oppress Aboriginal people today. So these are the things that you need to be mindful of when you're practising. What can you... Providing your best clinical care, we would expect that not to be um, nothing less, but to pro providing the care in a different way, we have an expectation that that will change. And we know that there's clinicians and very good clinicians, and some of those are sitting in the room with us today, that provide their service differently without fault. And so they get better, better health outcomes for individuals, and we're seeing that. And, and those, those average, some of those Aboriginal people are sitting in this room with us. Um, so, uh, any questions or 
remarks from the audience? Yeah, anything from the VC side? Yep. Before. Keep going. Yeah. Um, it was regarding when you've got patients that come up from country to this one was actually from Osborne Park Hospital who come up for dialysis and then have to move to Perth. Um, what is it as a health system that we can do to how do we manage that um, as a health system? Any comments around that? Yeah. Yep. I think that we would agree that that's an issue for you know for us um, being off country. I think we've sort of named up a number of those things being on country and how we connect them. I mean, even respite is really really important. We know that some of our mob actually go back for respite. So how can we enable those processes to take place? Communicating with I mean um, with areas. You know, we, and I know that clinicians do communicate with areas um, on country to uh, enable um, a, an opportunity or an opening for people to um, return back to country. I think it's still um, going to be a long journey and I know that um, as community organisations are setting up that they're looking at um, ways that they can actually provide services for their community in that space as well. So I'm not sure if there's... I'm just just a more of a sort of clinical type mm. question around that. Would an Aboriginal person prefer to have um, bag dialysis in their community as opposed to going on a machine and having to leave country? Yep, thank you. Oh, yeah. um, in relation to the question, are you asking to someone if they want to die on their homeland, where they belong, where they feel comfortable, where they can be buried around family, or do you want to be asking the question for them to die away from family? Oh, no, sorry, it wasn't it's question. dying, it's my Scottish accent. Sorry. It was yeah. whether they would have peritoneal dialysis with yeah. the bag, okay. if they would choose that over the machine dialysis, because then they could stay mm. on country. Oh, it would be, be awesome yeah. if they could stay off the country and get their stuff going. Yeah. yeah. But um, so, to get around So it. that would be a choice. Whereas a white person, we might rather choose to have the machine because we're not putting family and country at the top of our hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I see one of the solutions for this is, is you know, like if, if I had the budget, but I don't, um, in, in how we can... What are some of the things? There's two ways. One way is the fact that, yep, we have rural communities. One of the key things is that we have one of the biggest mining industries in Australia, in Western Australia, and yet we've still got people flying from those towns here and living down here, and as Thomas said, passing away down here. Look, how can we prevent people from getting to that dialysis stage with the information and support in the community, in their home setting, with the health workers, with whoever it is, the health services or the clinics, clinicians in that community to make sure that we don't have to bring people down here. The last thing I know some of my mob from Mickey there don't want to do is come down here. You know, um, you're away from family, away from the grandkids, away from the grandparents, whatever it might be. So, you know, that's what I look at. I look at that. The two salute, one of the two of the two things are either have more chairs available or more private, um, sorry, public health in relation to health promotion and things like that happening in the community, primary health care, so that we can get the health literacy moving to a perspective where we can actually we can actually stop people from coming to a, to here or getting to that level where they need to come to Perth. I've seen many people, friends and family of mine from, you know, from, from Jordan Mollow all the way through to Mikathara, come down here, live in a, move down, find somewhere to stay and then pass away here. You know, that's just not on. It's crazy. You know, we could be, you know, for people who live in the other side of Broome in the, or in the Pilbara or wherever, they're thousands of miles away from home. It's not good. Hi. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner that works within the community in the Pilbara. Um, and I just wanted to add something that I think what we need to start doing is instead of funding biomedical models all the time, we should start putting a lot more money into primary health care and having nurse practitioners out in those communities. 
Um, I've been working in Roburn for the last five years, the most beautiful place I've ever been. I love it. And uh, it, it, the, the things I've learned is absolutely amazing. But they give you money, and this is from, I won't say who gives us the money, has given us the money, but then after three, four years, the evaluation is there is no change or there's slight change because they don't evaluate the right questions and our funding is taken away. And then we start again at square one three years later. And to build up those relationships and be part of that community isn't just something you walk into. As you've all said, you know, it's, it takes a long time. And I think that we need to start lobbying government to look at moving away from this, putting people into hospital, getting them better and throwing them out. It's much more at, as you said, primary health care level, health literacy, health promotion, and keeping people where they belong at their hometown. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to do the one down the front? Um, I just wanted to say I worked with WAX um, based based here in Perth and um, what um, the service that we were providing was transport for um, country clients when they came down to Perth and then while they were down here. And so I'm kind of across, uh, you know, have some knowledge around um, pe um, country people coming down for dialysis and then having to stay down here. And I think that um, services are provided in, like, separately and I know that there are some good people that will try to work hard to ensure that the people, um, you know, the patient was supported. And that's still really difficult when there's systems in place. So, you know, there's, um, and so from what I've seen, I think a holistic approach to the care of the person when they come down and have to stay down here um, is probably what's going to be of benefit you know, instead of everyone providing, oh, I do this or I do that or that's your role or this is your role. And often they come down and they might stay not in a residence of their choosing but maybe in one of the um, supported accommodation. And sometimes, you know, some provide the best care or provide as much as they can and some don't, you know. So it's really, really difficult. And then when it's time to actually have to go home, that's actually quite a difficult thing to do as well. So I don't know, you know, all those who are involved in that care of that um, person who's coming down to stay down for dialysis, probably, you know, to work more collaboratively together. Because at the end of the day, it's their care and their health. And sometimes that deteriorates even more when they do come down. So, yeah, I think a collaborative approach and working together. Thank you. Yes. Um, just adding to that, it's yeah about the promotion back at home and coming from an Aboriginal health liaison point of view, they are put on a wait list straight away back in their community for their dialysis machines back at home. Um, but that is so high, so that's why their wait time down here is prolonged as well. So um, if there was, yeah, more promotion around funding to help with more machines back at home, it would reduce that number of them coming down. And the other thing as well, when they get down, because they're so homesick and um, missing home, they just leave the hospital and find family or someone that's down here that they know and um, will just stay close to them because it gives them that well feeling. Homesickness is a real thing. Um, I've experienced it. I don't travel much and I went out of WA just for four days and I couldn't eat. <laughs> I know I'm, it's not <laughs> good. Yeah. But yeah, I couldn't eat. I was um, so sick until I flew back into WA and I felt better. So yeah, it is a real thing how they feel and just being displaced from home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Think it links to the stress and the sense of not belonging. Yep. Yeah, and just further to that too, you know, we have a um, a group of people living off country, foreign foreign country really, 
and really desiring with all their hearts to go back and be in their own community. And it can be double-edged in for some of them because they know that the only way that they're going back is because one of their mobs going to die and to take that place. So I just wanted people yeah. to get that perspective as well. Someone has to die for them to be able to go home. So it's, it's while it's a happiness, there's that sorrow there too. So like um, you said, Ian, we have to look at primary health care, health promotion. We have to address this issue as, as a nation. VC site which relates to what people have been talking about and if someone wants to go back to land, back to their homeland to die um, and that it's not necessarily what the medical model suggests is the most appropriate but it's what they want to do, how do we support that and what do we do? If people really truly have been given all the options and uh, have decided that Going home and dying at home is one of those options. Um, it's informed. Um, allow it. Because as Aboriginal people, you know, we, we're very much a life-death life cycle. So dying is just a, much a part of living. You know, so as long as people are informed, um, for some of us, you know, as uh, healthcare professionals, of course we're going to try because our, you know, our oath we take is to first do no harm and help. Yes. So, um, but I totally, totally believe that if people want to die, and I'm, I've seen this with my mother, and it was such a heartbreaking decision for me, who the day before she passed away and I got her out of the hospital, I knew she shouldn't have come home out of the hospital, but she, the way she looked at me was like, don't send me home, I don't want to die there. So the heartbreaking decision for me was to respect my mother. And and yes, sadly, she did die that, that night. But you know what? I'm happy that she didn't die in a hospital and that was her choice. So let people yeah. have that choice That's as well. Yeah. Lynn? Oh, yes, Kenny. Yes. So I think, too, just some, from some of our experiences, we have a lot of wheat belt patients that attend the Midland hospitals. So um, even, even though it's not remote, but it is still home for those people and they're still in foreign territory. But it is about sort of, um, you know, ensuring that we can, um, accom you know, accommodate to their needs and ensure that we can, you know, communicate and link up with those services in their local area and actually make that as a priority and not just keep putting things off and, and complicating things further. Um, there are easy solutions, I always believe, and it is, a, it is a team effort, like Beth was saying before. And I think, you know, we all, if we all bring our skills, our knowledge and our expertise together, we will come up with that solution that fits best with that um, individual patient. So again, you know, it's about that communication and um, accompanying and considering those cultural needs too. Yep. And my talk goes back to um, dialysis, I guess. Because we have extended in families that we live in a lot, doesn't matter where we are, throughout our beautiful country. Um, it's really hard to have peritoneal dialysis in the home because you need a clean setting. When you're living in rural and remoteness, there's normally a lot of dust and things that are everywhere. But for me, I think it's really crucial that as a health service provider, that we start to build capacity of the local people upskilling the local people to actually be carers of their own people. We're always talking about health professionals, but health professionals come to remote areas and then they leave. You actually need to use the people that have lived there and lived there a long time and take them on a journey to helping their own people by upskilling them with whatever they need to do. That way they won't have to come from country. I'm speaking from experience because I've employed two grandmothers in Onslow to provide a heart health education to the people. And those grandmothers sometimes feel very, very tired because of their home life, 
They don't rest. They're on duty 24 hours a day. But when we call on them and we, we visit them, they're actually there to talk to us, to take us on a journey of what they've done with their people. Sometimes they come here to the city. But by building capacity of people that didn't have any skills, we're actually benefiting improvement in health in Onslow where there are no services. There is a hospital, but it's not a place where a lot of the people locally want to go. They have a doctor that goes there uh, three days once a fortnight. That may have changed, I'm not sure. But people in those areas have nothing. How do you maintain health in those regions when they've got nothing to go to, nobody to support them? The only way you can really do that is to actually employ the people and work with the local people, whether they be grandmothers, whether they be uncles, aunties, whoever. It's time we started out, how do we make a difference in the communities where the people need us most? Sure, they come down here. Sure, there's a quick fix here, but when they go home, there's nothing. So how do we actually help them when they go home? It burdens me to see that these people go home all the time and there's nothing at the other end. So I think it's time that the health department and the people that hold the funding dollars start putting it into the communities and supporting people on their lands, in their communities. It doesn't take a lot of money. It takes passion, commitment and dedication from the people locally. Mm. And then the, there are people that do travel there as health professionals who say, oh, I'll be there for 18 months and end up staying eight years or more. That's what we need, people with a commitment, people that love what they're doing for the people that they're servicing not just another job. Well done, Lynn. Thanks for that. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and you're right, we have a natural resource in our communities. Let's look at creating and developing that resource to actually support our families in that community. Um, I've been using that analogy for, for years and years when I used to work in the um, rural health process and, and in relation to research and stuff like that in South Australia. One of the things I'm lucky enough to experience well, was the fact that anybody who um, flew in and they were palliative for whatever reason within a, a particular hospital, there was a process of reuniting them back home to actually go home and do what they need to do and pass away when they needed to pass away in their own country. Because one of the key issues that, that this hospital had was when other old people come from that community or the community near that, because it's all one big community, basically, all the people out who live out in the west coast of, west of South Australia. They actually are in the hospital. And for the people who don't go home and pass away, their spirits are still in their hospital walking around trying to get home. And old people see them. Old people know they're there. And the young people see them and know they're there. Families see them. So we need to make it a effort to make sure that we get our people home so they can rest their spirit at home. Because if we want to talk about how we can connect and understand better with Aboriginal people and culture, um, as Nolan said, we're, we're, we're a life and death culture. We celebrate both. And we need to make sure that we get our people home so that their spirits don't get lost walking around hospitals like this or other hospitals in around communities. I'll leave this up here. Thank you. Yep. I just um, wanted to... Um, uh, reply to what Lynn has said. I'm Selena West and I'm the manager of the Aboriginal Health Unit with Community and Population Health. We run, uh, we facilitate a, an amazing amount of programs throughout South and North and now East Metro Health Service. Um, we have programs running and being facilitated by trained health professionals throughout the whole of Metro and they do a fantastic job. Um, what I would like to see is more integrated care into those programs so that more community members are actually attending them. We have great outcomes from the programs that we do run and the staff are all professionally trained, but unless we actually have our referral processes into our programs so that we can extend the knowledge that these health professionals have 
so that people can actually start to self-manage and self-care for themselves at home and in the community with their families, that's what we need to be sort of developing further through is so that people have the skills and knowledge so that they know exactly how to care for themselves, whether it be in the hospital sitting with, setting with the hospital liaison officers or at home where they're, where they're not getting much care at all, they can come to the education programs that we have to actually learn how to self-manage. So building more capacity in, um, in programs through community to see what community actually need and want um, is, is a really big area that we sort of need to focus on as well. But thank you, Lynn, that was a great comment that you made. In that space, if it's the referral process that lets things down, and we've talked a lot about collaboration and connection and communication, um, tracks can help and be like the vessel that, through our website, we can put up all those resources and all the uh, connections to all your services so they can be distributed widely. Yep, so we'd be happy to meet with you around that. Yep. Lola? I'm just, I'll probably just on that note before we move on to the next yes. thing. Um, I, I just want to really, um, and Kerry pointed it out earlier, I think, and so did Christine, I think we're in a time where we have to take responsibility for ourselves and how we actually undertake our business on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, once again, there's some really good people that do that very effectively. Um, and and Aboriginal people are there to offer the, their services in that space, but we're not we're not always accessible. Um, so I think you know it's every individual has to contribute in you know in response to their um, making. The difference for the patient in the interest of the patient's better health outcomes so you know as, as I said we're close you know we're trying to close the gap and what does that gap look like for individuals who are working in that space alongside us and I think we do need to think holistically and, I, and just to give you some um, statistical data in the metro area the metro holds a pop, the most population of Aboriginal people compared to the state now I'm not sure if people are familiar with that so, um, and then if we look at that and the limited amount of Aboriginal people working within um, a, an element of health service, um, we work holistically. So knowing who your resources are, as was indicated by um, um, one of the other workers in the room, I think is really, really critical. But then upskilling yourselves to be effective and how you actually work with that patient through the patient journey, whether it's in primary health care or in the tertiary setting, to ensuring that they're going to get picked up by somebody who's going to do the right thing by that individual. They're key things that I think we need to consider because we've all got responsibilities in that space. Um, we might move on now to men's and women's business uh, comes under clinical and non-clinical. So could I pass to one of the members of the panel to speak to um, clinical or non-clinical with regard to, I mean, obviously, you know, things like putting catheters in a clinical, uh, <laughs> then there's a lot of non-clinical yeah. men's and women's um, So, obviously, speaking from a non-clinical perspective, I think the challenge we have out at Midland is that we, um, there's 1.5 of my role and we're both female. So, um, that obviously poses an issue when it comes to engaging with our men and particularly if they are off country. Um, it's okay a, a little bit if they're obviously in Yungar because it does help if, if you're also in Yungar so you've got that, um, you know, already uh, relationship, I guess. But I think importantly, um, you know, I, I often think about um, how important, and as I said earlier, Aboriginal health is huge. Um, we need to ha make that as core business and we've got to stop employing one ALO in, a, in, in these large hospitals. We can have 10 social workers on every ward, why can't we have 10 ALOs on every ward as well or, you know, to accommodate to those needs. So those things have got to start shifting a little bit and it all comes back to the big F word. Um, you know, we've got to start putting more, yeah, <laughs> the funding word. <laughs> Let's get that clear. <laughs> 
Um, you know, we've got to start um, putting more pressure on our local PHNs, our primary health networks. It's their responsibility now in the primary health care sector. So what are they doing in terms of their, um, you know, the primary health care engagement as well as the local hospital networks engagement? Um, you know, unfortunately, there's all these services out there that are vying for the funding. So I, I believe Aboriginal workforce is, is a key thing that we need to start looking at and building and growing that much further to ensure that we're um, covering areas and spe specifically areas like this that are um, obviously a huge thing across hospitals.